Hello everyone, this is Richard with the Modern Health Span newsletter. First a disclaimer, in this newsletter series we will share the latest research studies, news and events in health span field that we have found interesting. It is not a recommendation or medical advice. First we would like to give a shout out to our supporters who are very generous to buy us some coffees. It encourages us to continue to share information on ageing research. Thank you so much for your support. Our first paper today is a review of a study on CD38 and how this impacts our NAD levels as we age. As I think we know, NAD levels decrease with age and this appears to contribute to metabolic dysfunction. It has been shown that knocking out CD38 partially prevents this decline. However, it's not known how CD38 is regulated and how its ectoenzymatic activity impacts NAD homeostasis which is to say the levels of NAD. As a note, an ectoenzyme is one that works outside or on the surface of a cell. In this case CD38 is on the cell surface and acts in the intracellular space, although we, as we can see here it is also present inside the cell. In this study they show that the increase in CD38 in white adipose tissue, this is white fat cells, and the liver during aging is mediated by an accumulation of immune cells with CD38 attached. Inflammation increases the amount of CD38 and decreases NAD. This increase in senescent cells and the secreted signals from them, called SASP, promote CD38 cells in fat tissue. Removing the senescent cells or the SASP decreases CD38 and helps boost NAD. Inhibiting the activity of CD38 outside the cell can increase NAD plus through NMN dependent processes. These findings demonstrate that senescence induced inflammation promotes an accumulation of CD38 in immune cells that through activities outside of the cell decrease NAD and NMN. Here is the main process diagrammatically. We can see the senescent cells in the liver and white fat tissue release SASP which attracts more macrophage immune cells with CD38 on them. CD, the CD38 converts NMN to NAM. One other interesting thing I did see in this paper is this section. Here they say that in, in a cell with low SLC12A8 they did not see NMN increase the NAD levels in the cell. However in AML12, a kind of mouse liver cell which does have the transporter, the NAD levels did increase pointing to the transporter working for NMN. In our effort to maintain our NAD levels as we age, this shows that it is also important to inhibit CD38. Our next paper is a safety trial for NMNC in sprayed Dorley rats. NMNC is a synthetic and proprietary form of NMN developed by Senec, a company based in Lausanne, Switzerland. In a previous newsletter we talked about the same company running an NMN trial in France. This study looked at acute and subchronic oral toxicity for high purity NMNC. The authors did a short term toxicity study with 2,666 milligrams per kilogram of body weight, whereas for a comparison a typical dose in a trial would be between 300 and 500 milligrams per kilogram. This dose did not lead to any mortality or treatment related adverse effects. There was also a subchronic study for 90 days with 375, 750 and 1500 milligrams per kilogram of body weight, again with no toxic effects as seen by any of the parameters which they looked at. They concluded that there was no adverse effects for the dosage that they gave the animals. We picked this study because as well as showing safety for high dose NMN, it also involved a new synthetic form of NMN. It's interesting to see new ways of manufacturing NMN being developed we will have to watch to see what comes of it. Our last paper looks at plant-based low-fat high-carb versus the animal-based ketogenic diet. The authors were particularly looking to see how many calories would be consumed when as much food as desired was available. The purpose of the study was to test the hypothesis that high-carb diets lead to excess insulin, accumulation of fat and increased energy intake, with the implication that low-carb would have reduced energy intake. 20 people were admitted as inpatients so they lived in the facility and were randomized to either 
have a plant-based, low-fat, high-carb diet or an animal-based, ketogenic, low-carb diet with each group having each diet for two weeks and then switching over. The authors were looking for the energy intake where they found that on the low-fat diet the participants had less calories with the conclusion that the prediction that high-carb diet would lead to excess calories being consumed appeared to be incorrect. Here are a couple of quotes from the press release by the NIH. High fat may increase calories because there is more calories per bite, whereas high carb can lead to swings in blood glucose and may increase hunger. The senior investigator said there was benefits to both in the short term. The low fat plant-based diet helped to curb appetite while the ketogenic diet resulted in lower and more steady insulin and glucose levels. He added that he does not know if this will be maintained over the long term. For me, I am more focused on keeping my insulin and glucose under control, so I will stick to my low-carb diet. A new skin patch brings us closer to a wearable all-in-one health monitor. Engineers at the University of California, San Diego, have developed a soft, stretchy skin patch the size of a postage stamp that can be worn on the neck to continuously track blood pressure and heart rate, while also measuring the wearer's level of glucose as well as lactate, alcohol or caffeine. It is the first wearable device that monitors cardiovascular signals and multiple biochemical levels in the human body at the same time. Now our event corner. There are two events we would like to talk about today. Both events registration links can be found in the description. First, a 10 episode webinar series about female reproductive aging and its impact on women's health and equality. The webinars are held by the Buck Institute and National University of Singapore. Exports from different labs from all over the world will showcase the science that can make reproductive longevity a reality. The webinar series has already started with the first one on February the 18th, but there are still nine episodes. The next one will be February the 25th at 4 p.m. PST. Next, the Food Sensitivities and Autoimmunity Summit. It is an online event and free from March the 1st to the 7th. The event will discuss the root causes of autoimmunity, food sensitivity and food intolerances. The speakers include Dr. Terry Walls, Dr. David Perlmutter and Dr. Michael Murray. Thank you all for watching. I hope that you found the newsletter informative. As we find more interesting research and longevity news, we will release our next newsletter, so please stay tuned. Please do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell button and select all for any new video release notifications. It encourages us to continue to create more videos about anti-aging and extending healthy lifespan. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and we'll speak to you again soon.